Hello there, welcome. Today we're talking about how to invest right now, how to invest in 2023. It's funny how uh, this question comes up every six months, right? This is for the last four years. Um, every time something changes, and it's been an interesting market we've been in the last few years, but every six months, the question comes up, is this the right time to invest? Mm -hmm. uh, and we're it's, we're excited to talk about this because uh, you know, the market has shifted again a bit, and we're going to talk about that today. It's really interesting. The market has changed more often than ever in these last few years. And I understand why people are asking these, this question because new investors, as they're getting started, when they haven't witnessed these changes and been a part of those cycles, as an investor, it becomes very hard to really understand what's happening when you're trying to jump into real estate. So yeah. this is a great topic Absolutely. and we're excited to talk about it. And so the three key things that we're going to talk about today to address that question of how to invest in 2023. Number one, we're going to start with a perspective, uh, which is an investor's, pers investor's perspective, right? We've been investing for the last six, seven years um, and we've worked with investors investing all over the US. We analyze 50 plus deals every week in all over the US. I want to add something here, actually, because a lot of people don't know this, but what Didi does on a weekly basis inside our uh, members only program is insane. It is so amazing. He looks at deals from all over the country, all kinds of different markets with investors who have different risk tolerances. He looks over actual deals that are on the market right now. He looks over the pictures. He gives them his perspective on the numbers. And when people get the property under contract, we're able to see how the deal actually worked out. And you're able to also see what it ARV is for, what the after repair value is when they go through the deal and what happens at the end. And he's been doing this for years inside our program. So it's amazing, like the amount of knowledge that you've gathered throughout different markets through this process. I think it's great to see not only for our own deals, as you said, but just what's happening throughout the country for all, uh, you know, so many different investors. So we're going to talk about one, we're going to talk about uh, perspective mm -hmm. on market cycles uh, using numbers because we love numbers. Number two, we're going to talk about identifying uh, what you need to work on in this specific market cycle. And we're going to cover what has happened, how the markets has changed over the last few years and what specifically you need to do now. Uh, and then thirdly, we're going to talk about uh, what skills you need to develop in 2023 to be able to burr well. So let's get started. I love it. Can I start with a story? Yeah. <laughs> so when we first got started investing, it was a very weird time. It was, we had just come out of that bubble crash and everyone was wondering, is this the right time to invest? And we remember there were a lot of people asking that question when we first got started. While we've built a $10 million portfolio, some of those people are still asking that question. And so as we've seen all of this change and the growth that we've witnessed during this time, I wonder if we simply just don't ask this question, is this the right time to invest? But instead, think about how do I take advantage of this right yes, now? Yes, exactly right. It's The question is not, should I be investing? The question should be, how should I be investing? Right. Absolutely. And uh, and so let's talk about uh, the perspective a little bit with numbers. And for anyone who's uh, doesn't know what the Burr strategy is, which is what we focus on a lot. It's buy and hold investing, but it's essentially you buy a distressed property, you rehab it, you rent it, you refinance uh, and pull all your cash out and use that cash for your next deal. Now there's, uh, we're going to talk about specifically for Burr, uh, how the numbers shake out uh, because it's a long-term buy and hold strategy, right? And that's what truly builds the wealth. So let's look at some numbers. Let's say uh, a property that you bird um, appraised for $200,000 once you're done with it. So say you uh, purchase the property for $100,000, you put in $50,000 of rehab into it, and then it appraised for $200,000, right? And you were able to pull your cash out. Um, 
in this scenario, let's fast forward 10 years and see what happens to this property. All right, let's look at some numbers. So there's three main ways that you're going to make money from this property. One is the cash flow. So let's assume this property cash flows at $300 a month after you pay your mortgage, expenses, everything, right? So $300 a month, you're left within profit, which is $3,600 a year, which is $36,000 that you'll earn in cash flow in the next 10 years, right? So that's just from cash flow, you're going to earn $36,000 for that one property. Number two, the property is going to uh, the debt for the property is going to get paid down, right? And so if you put the numbers in a uh, in a bank amortization calculator, you're going to pay down that loan by about $25,000 in the next 10 years. So, so far we have $36,000 in cash flow plus the $25,000 that you're going to pay down the debt for. So that's total of about $60,000, right? So that's two ways that you're earning money. The third way you're going to earn money in this property is through appreciation. Now, let's be very conservative and say the property appreciates by 3% each year for the next 10 years. Even if the market goes down by a bit and then it comes back up, it doesn't matter because in 10 years, it's going to come back up, right? And on an average, it'll be conservatively 3%. And a lot of us have seen very recently, it's not even close to, it's like 20% in certain markets, right? Right. So 3% is super conservative. So using 3% uh, as, as an annual increase, uh, you'll the property value will go up by about sixty eight thousand dollars for this property. That's amazing. Now let's be even more conservative and say it doesn't go up by sixty eight thousand in the next ten years. It goes up by forty thousand in the next ten years, right? So you so take not even three percent. Not even this is like less than two percent increase wow. a year for the next ten years. Now let's take the uh, sixty thousand dollars that you had through cash flow and debt pay down and add the forty thousand dollars in appreciation you will make $100,000 conservatively in the next 10 years from that one property that right. you bored. And because you bored it, you don't have, uh, you have very little to no money in the deal anyway. Right, so because you, you pulled all your original cash out right? yes, and forced it to appreciate. So it, you created the down payment within itself. Right, so this is why this perspective is so important. So very conservatively, you're going to make $100,000 in the next 10 years from that one property, regardless of what happens to the market. Now, you can, now people say, oh, well, what if I go over my rehab budget, but $10,000. Mm -hmm. Yes, but you're going to make $100,000 in the next 10 years. Right. What if your property doesn't ARV? ARV is less by $15,000. Yes, but you're going to make $100,000 in the next 10 years, <laughs> right? What if my interest rate is really high? Uh, yes, but even if you don't increase your rents at all, uh, in the next 10 years, and you're which still, you will. which you will. Right. I mean, typically we increase our rents by at least 3%. And the last at two least. years, it's gone up by a lot more than and that. That's lower than inflation, right? So like, you're not even, we're talking again, being very conservative yeah. with the rents increase as well. So that is a perspective that's very, now that you think about buy and hold that way, like in conservatively in the next 10 years, you're going to make hundred thousand dollars per property. Right. And so um, then that takes away all the doubt of like, oh, what if, so uh, buy and hold is a very forgiving strategy. It's super right? forgiving. It's not like a flip, flip right. where you buy and then you have to sell it no matter what, even if there's a loss, you have to sell it. And right. at that point, it is what it is. But buy and hold, because even though you may uh, lose 10K or 15K, uh, you know, it, it, due to various reasons in your, in your project, you're still going to make 100K in the next 10 years yeah. because of, the hold of the buy and hold. Right. And I think that's the key. And, and I love that. And you can always re refinance it later. There's the, you own the property, which is what makes it so forgiving. And yes. And so we're going to talk about that now because right. this is, you know, we talked about the high level perspective of like, this is what you need to understand as an investor that it's buy and hold is a long term, buy and hold is a long term game. Right. Now let's come to what you need to do specifically in this market. Can we talk about that? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So let's rewind a little bit to when we started investing, right? Every market has its own sort of pros and cons. Mm -hmm. And as an investor, you want to identify what those pros and cons are because whatever the disadvantages are in that market, you need to address those and put a little bit more work into addressing that. Every No market is perfect for right. investing, right? Every right. market has its pros and cons. So let's talk about, let's rewind a bit. Let's go back uh, to when we started investing in 2014, 2015. Back then, 
the interest rates were super low. Mm -hmm. Those are the pros. These are the pros. The interest rates were low. Uh, The properties, the deals were easier to find because there are not that many investors in the market. But it was very hard to find financing. Right. So correct. So even though the interest rates were super low, it was very hard to obtain financing as an investor, which is not the case right now. How many banks did you call back in 2014, 2015 when you're finding your first property? When we first got started, I called, I think, 90 some banks and created a giant encyclopedia because everyone had very stringent considerations on what they needed to see before they would fund a deal. And it's not like that anymore. It's very different right now. And as I've seen that and now seeing this, it we can see all the opportunities. Right. And and really, you know, back then, the biggest challenge was the financing piece. And so you had to put a little bit more work into obtaining financing. But yes. you, once you did that, everything else fell into place. Right. Right. So that was what we were trying to solve for back then. There was still challenging. There were still challenges in that market. Yeah. Right. Then True. fast forward a bit to COVID when COVID hit. Yeah. In the last couple of years, everybody knows what happened. Right. Uh, this is back in 2020, 2021. Uh, it was very easy to obtain financing. So it's flipped, right, Right, in 2021. There were so many lenders because of quantitative easing, because of all the money that was printed. You could find a lender for any deal that you wanted at really low interest rates. So when when we first got started, the interest rates were low-ish, but they were not lending very easily. During COVID, when COVID first hit, they wanted to lend money. And so along with the low interest rates, they started offering a lot of incentives for investors to borrow money. And I remember the first time we heard that there was a 30-year fixed commercial loan that was available that was super low interest rate at that time. I mean, low compared to what, what you were seeing now, we were completely, we were so surprised by that. Yeah. And and that was, that was a great opportunity at that time. But right. then again, it came with its own challenges. Yes. And so the challenges in 2020, 2021, for those of you who are investing, was your labor costs were really high. It was impossible to find contractors. Your um, materials were high. Lumber was, uh, prices went up dramatically. Materials were hard to find and expensive. Mm-hmm. And deals were hard to come by because financing was so easily available. Every deal that you wanted to go after had 10 other offers on it and cash offers. So it was hard to get a deal under contract. So even in that market, there were challenges. And then you had to do certain things to overcome those challenges, which is, you know, increase your build like your deal funnel, uh, deal pipeline where you had deals coming to you and you had to look at a lot more deals to be able to put an offer. You put in a lot more offers, lost a lot of offers before you got one. So you had to put in offers in getting it. You had to put more effort into finding a deal. That was a challenge for that market. Right. So now the market has flipped again. Let's see what's going on right now. Yes, the interest rates are up dramatically, right? Because the Fed is trying to control inflation. So interest rates are up a lot, but the competition has gone down for deals, right? right? So when it was 10 offers on a property, now it's easier, becoming easier to find deals. Mm -hmm. Labor prices have gone down again because it's easier now to find contractors. Mm -hmm. Uh, Materials prices have... Uh, stabilized again. So it's not as expensive as it was in 21, 22, right? So every market, as you said, has its pros and cons. What you need to do as an investor is figure out what the current market is doing and what you need to focus your time on and put extra effort into. Right now, Mm -hmm. it's the higher interest rate. So you have to figure out how to work around that. And we'll talk about that. And if you're a new investor, you're kind of looking at it and you're thinking the, the barrier to entry seems really high. Think about how that works in your favor. Anytime you see that the barrier of entry is it's getting tougher because of financing constraints. And if you're coming into investing with a little bit of money and an income, you're coming into investing, you have a leg up. Is that the term? If you have a leg up over (laughs) over people who are coming into investing with no money or no job, Now, all of those other new investors who are coming into investing, they have no money, they have uh, no W-2, no job, they're getting priced out. 
yeah. right? They're not going to be able to obtain financing because the interest rates are already high and, you know, things are a little bit different right now. So yeah. instead of thinking that the barrier to entry is high, think about how that reduces your competition as a new investor. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, really with in this market right now, with the interest rates high, what you need to do is is make sure you're doing a couple of things, mm-hmm. right? One is uh, because there's less a competition, now you can get properties at a deeper discount. So make sure you're putting in, uh, you know, lower offers, make sure you're negotiating really well when you're buying these properties so that you're keeping your costs low. Uh, when you're doing a rehab, make sure you get your rehab done uh, under budget or on budget right. uh, to make sure manage you know, your projects manage well. your projects well. Right, that's and where you're putting a little bit of extra effort in. Right, and this is the time you want to learn how to do good project management. Whether you are doing a bar in your own backyard or if you're investing out of state, this is the time to learn how to manage projects really well. Yes, and. The third most important thing you need to do right now in this market is understand commercial financing. Absolutely. Because that's what, that's where you're going to, you know, we, we've closed on a couple of refinances recently and we've paid about, we got about six and a half percent interest, right? Uh, and there's other in, uh, lenders who are probably going to give you slightly better rates, even if you were, if you look hard enough. Right. Right. Uh, but you need to understand commercial financing and commercial financing is when you buy a property under an LLC because you're running it like a business, like you should. And then you find lenders who are going to lend to that LLC and commercial financing rates are actually going to be, um, uh, you know, typically they're higher, but they're you can, you always can always going to be a little bit higher than conventional financing. But commercial financing does not go on your credit report. Yes. You're running it like a business. It's separate from your personal credit and from your personal expenses. It doesn't matter if you have to pay a little bit high in interest rate. You keep your business separate from your personal life. Yes. That's what this does. And uh, And (laughs) we get so excited when we talk about financing. It, It also offers you ultimate scalability, which yes. is what we absolutely love about commercial financing. It it can solve for a few things, right? Conventional financing, you you cannot get more than say 10 properties in your own name with a loan. Commercial financing, there is no limit. Yeah. And commercial financing, you can also find asset-based lenders. They're going to lend based on how your property is doing, how the deal is doing, whether that's profitable or not regardless of your personal debt to income. And the conventional loans for investment properties are getting harder and the terms are getting worse. So for instance, uh, some of those new uh, rules if you're coming in for for conventional loans, your seasoning period is going up from six months to 12 months, which means that you cannot refinance until you own, uh, own the property for 12 months. Whereas in commercial mortgages, those rules don't apply, especially DSCR loans and, and some of those loans that are out there. So understanding commercial financing right now in 2023 is the biggest bang for your buck in terms of Absolutely. being able to do BOR successfully. That. So that's, I think to recap, I think we, we covered some, we uh, covered a lot. We covered a lot today. So let's, <laughs> let's recap, right? So one is knowing the power of buy and hold investing, knowing that even if knowing that birth strategy is very forgiving, mm-hmm. right? So even if you go over your rehab a little bit, even if you maybe don't get the ARV that you're looking for long-term in the next 10 years, you're going to make a hundred K from that property. Right? So have that perspective, at the back of your mind. Number two, you want to recognize where we are in this market and the market may shift again, right? If the market and people are saying, oh, what if there's a recession? Well, if there's a recession, that's again, a great time to buy because you can you can buy properties at a deeper discount. Guess what we're going to do if the market goes down again? We've been priced out of certain neighborhoods that used to invest back in 2015. They were great neighborhoods, but it became very expensive. If there's a recession, we can go back into those markets and buy more properties because we know long-term they're going to appreciate, yes. right? And then finally, figuring out what your gaps are in your knowledge. Now, as I said, Burr is very forgiving, but you need to know your basics. Right. You need to be able to analyze deals really well. Right. You need to understand commercial financing. You need to learn how to manage your rehabs. Right. Once you do those three things, you can be successful in any market, not not just right now. What I would do to conduct a gap analysis, can I go over that, how I would do it? If 
I had to do a gap analysis. I would take a piece of paper. I would write the letters of the BRRRR strategy, top to bottom, B-R-R, right? Go down. And then think of your capabilities in terms of a traffic light. Yes. Right? Am I green? Meaning I have not only learned how to do this, built a solid foundation, but I've also implemented it once. And then I have actually figured out how to build systems, teams, and processes for that specific step. That's your green light. If you've done it once, if you've tried it once, you're okay at it, that's your yellow. And if you have only learned the fundamentals of the strategy through podcasts and books and, you know, all kinds of different things, that's your, your red. I would consider myself red yeah. because implementation is everything, right? So I would go through hey, acquisition, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat, where am I, red or green or yellow? And and yeah. figure out, c- conduct your gap analysis and figure out where the gaps are. And now you know, right? Now you know where you stand. Now you know what you need to work on. Now you have facts on paper. There is no... Um, there's no guesswork anymore. Yes, absolutely. So, and I think once you take that approach, it doesn't become about, you know, and, and you understand the market, then the question is not, should I invest right now? It's, it's about how do I invest right now? The best time to plant a tree was 10 years back and the next best time is now, right? As an investor, you're always thinking, how do I, you never stop investing. You're like, all right, how do I invest in this market cycle right. so that my I can keep my asset for the next 10, 15, 20 years? 100%. All right. So if you enjoyed this episode and if you loved the concept of gap analysis, uh, we have a five-day real estate investor accelerator going on. You can go to www.theinvestoraccelerator.com to sign up. I go in much more detail over how to conduct this gap analysis. We've got a download in there too. I forget what day it is out of the five days, but go and do this. And it's really going to give you a clear picture of what you need to work on. And we do a lot more in the challenge. We reverse engineer your retirement, build your investor brand. It's really fun. It's a great group of people. Uh, Come join us. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. And see you next time. Bye, everyone.